coffee, big cup, and hello. Welcome back to another episode of the Gilmore Away podcast. I'll be honest, when I think of shows with iconic fashion moments, I'm more likely to come up with Gossip Girl or Sex in the City, not Gilmore Girls. But fashion and costuming are important parts of the narrative experience of this show, even when they're not the focus of attention. So this week, we're going to be looking at the costuming choices that were made on the show and how the fashion choices define the characters. What are their classic uniforms? What did these looks say about them and inform how we relate to them? How did their style evolve across the seasons? How does shopping and consumerism fit in? All fantastic questions. And I think the Festival of Living Art is a really great time to talk about this because of the reality um, of the costuming and just the really impressive costuming that we see done for the festival itself. But it's also a new fashion era for Rory and seen in a mall is also on the horizon, which also has the Gilmore women pining for new wardrobes, understandably so. Uh, but before we get into all of that, if you could just do all of those YouTube things for us, please like this video, share, subscribe to our channel, comment, um, send this video to any of your friends who like Gigi as much as we do. Uh, we would be eternally grateful. All of the support really does help us out. Let's dive into our synopses. All right. Season four, episode eight, the Festival of Living Art. After a flood in Woodbury, Taylor agrees to host the annual Festival of Living Pictures in Stars Hollow again. Rory is tapped to portray the title subject in Portrait of a Young Girl Named Antea by Parmigianino. Did I get that right? How do I do that? <laughs> I'm so proud right now, but yeah. <laughs> Little Italian heart is so proud. Yeah, so <laughs> and Lorelai is disappointed when she's not chosen for the Renoir Girl after she flinched on stage the last time they hosted. Kirk plays Jesus and beefs with Judas, portrayed by the town troubadour. <laughs> Lane, Zach, and Brian are auditioning for new guitarists to replace Dave, but their search is disappointing until Gil shows up. The only problem is, is he's almost twice their age. Suki announces her intention to have a home birth, and Lorelai meets her midwife, Bruce, and at the end of the episode, she finally goes into labor after a mini freakout that he won't come out of her sandpaper innards. <laughs> I love that line. Oh, I ate too much roughage as a, roughage as a child. <laughs> Oh, the woes of pregnancy. <laughs> uh, this is followed up by episode nine, Die Jerk. And Rory received some criticism from her editor about her latest articles for the Yale Daily News not having, not having enough of her opinion in them. So when she goes to a pretty terrible ballet performance, she does not hold back with her thoughts about the production or the lead ballerina who takes umbrage at being called a hippo and hunts Rory down to yell at her. Meanwhile, Jason is pursuing Lorelai romantically and gets himself invited to dinner to continue to flirt with her and kind of ingratiate himself with Emily. Yeah, I mean, color me shocked that the ballerina was mad. Very offended. Yeah, we've talked about fat shaming already. No bueno. So I'd be yeah. mad too, or displeased. And, you know, Rory says... You know, the whole roller on the bra strap thing. It's the costumer's fault. Uh, um, I think you're you're missing the point here, Roar. Um, nice try, but no. A little bit, a little bit. <laughs> yeah. Well, this will this will be a fun one, I think, because, you know, um, you've seen my closet. <laughs> I have I, many times. I like clothes. I like shopping. Sometimes I don't like what that does to my pocketbook. But, you know, it's something I have a bit of an interest in. And so I wanted to look at it on the show. You know, there are plenty of people who talk about um, the pieces themselves and sometimes even hunt them down. Um, like Stars Hollow Clothier on Instagram is a good example of like someone who actually finds what the pieces are and like kind of where you can get them. And people will talk about their favorite outfits or their least favorite outfits. And we'll do a little bit of that in this one. But I kind of wanted to take like a, a bigger picture and focus on some particular moments where fashion comes into play and, and says something about the characters and their relations to each other. So, you know, clothing is a signifier of self-expression, status, money, wealth, values, all of these things, lifestyle, um, and we see that play out across the series. So let's get into it. Yeah, it's definitely an embodiment, I think, of who you are as a person. 
To an extent. I mean, there's always going to be inward personality traits, things that don't initially come to the forefront. But I think fashion and style definitely do play a part in terms of a representation of who you are as a person. And it's never anything that we should be outwardly judging on. But it's just it is reflective, I think, for a lot of people, if not most of, again, the individuality and what you're trying to put forth and and just a representation of you. So I'm really excited to talk about how we see that portrayed in the show, who does it well, who does it not so great, some of the best and worst costuming moments because there are good and bad, trust us, and we'll get to all of those. Um, but where would you like to kick us off this evening? I'm gonna start off with a question. This is a little more general. It's like, why do we yearn for material items in the first place? Why do we like to shop? What is it about like clothing shopping that so grabs us? Uh, you know, again, two big shoppers here. We've shopped together quite a bit. And uh, I've even picked out some of your clothes. <laughs> so, like, why do you think that as a species, we're so into fashion that goes kind of like above and beyond our basic needs to clothe our bodies for comfort and um, sort of like protection from the elements, if you will? <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think it's always going to vary person to person. There are going to be some people who just, you know, don't give a you know what about it at the end of the day. That is certainly not us. Um, but I think for a lot of people, you know, at the end of the day, sometimes it's just its own form of like self care and its own form of like comfort to just be able to say like, you know, this is not necessarily something that I need, but it's something that I want because I've seen it. It appeals to me. It looks good. This could even go beyond you know, fashion and clothes in terms of lending itself to like accessories and shoes and other parts of like, you know, the fashion component from head to toe. But I think at the end of the day, to answer your question, sometimes it's just because, you know, it's its, its own form of self gratification, but self gratification in a way that I don't think necessarily needs to be looked down upon in any sort of negative way or with a negative connotation. You know, it's, it's not wrong to want to be frivolous, so to say, every once in a while, or to see an outfit that you think appeals to you and that you think would look good on you. And it's just something that you want to have. I think in moderation, as long as you're keeping it, you know, as long as anyone is keeping their themselves in check, I think it's good. It's, it's you know, balance it with like ostentatiousness. But I think it's just, I think it really stems from, you know, it's nice to just see something that appeals to you and just to say like, I want to have that because it will make me feel better about having it. It's something that I will enjoy wearing. Um, it speaks to me and it, you know, vibes with my personality or with my own personal style. So I think that's why like sometimes, you know, we do go out and we do go shopping because we want to have that satisfaction of just acquiring things that are going to, enable us to have that level of comfort and feel good about ourselves at the end of the day. Yeah, I think there's a dangerous level of that, as you said, like everything in moderation, right? But sometimes when we're spending kind of uh, almost unthinkingly at times, that can be a signal of deeper unhappiness, which we see and seen in a mall when Emily goes on her shopping rampage. Um, so, you know, that's the dark side of acquisition, shall we say? Um, yeah, I think self-care is a good way to put it. You know, like sometimes if I'm, you know, not feeling the greatest, it is nice to go and like get a few new things to add to my wardrobe. Um, the unfortunate part is that that sort of, that satisfaction doesn't necessarily last. Um, you know, it sort of loses its luster over time. And so we need to be careful when it comes to impulse spending. And I mean, this is advice to myself too. It's not like... <laughs> judgment on anyone else because I do this myself quite a bit um to the point where you know I don't have space for any more clothes really <laughs> I I have quite a, a wardrobe myself but um I think part of it also is marketing we're just told that we need to have the kind of like consumers trappings of success and so the fact that you can buy things frequently and replace things before they've lived out their natural functional lives is a signifier of of your class and your status um and again emily falls into this not only in her fashion actually her fashion is quite stable and um classic but it 
it manifests a little bit differently for her where she does it to her space more often than her like actual body. I'm sure she does a lot of clothing shopping as well, but we see her rewear a lot of the same suits in a way that we don't necessarily always see other characters repeating their items, even though she's extremely wealthy. Um, but even beyond just sort of like the marketing of you must have things so that you look like you fit in and so that people can tell that you're successful. There's also the idea of your fantasy self, right? I think that's a big part of my shopping issue is, you know, you buy things because they represent a version of yourself that you want to be. And a lot of people don't go beyond the shopping to actually try to affect the changes to be that person. They just want to look like that person because it's the kind of like the easier way to do it. So, you know, like I have so many things in my wardrobe where it's just like, sure, I'm not wearing it now, but that doesn't mean that in six months, my life won't look different and I won't have an opportunity to wear all those sequin mini dresses I bought during the pandemic, <laughs> you know? Um, when it's something doesn't suit your lifestyle now, but you, you want that lifestyle again, like it's the same part of the reason that I'm holding on to a lot of my old work wardrobe from, you know, my office days and my courthouse days. Cause like, yeah, right now I work at a bookstore where I could show up in track pants and my boss wouldn't care. Um, but I may not always be there. And I want that version of my wardrobe that's full of blazers and slacks and, and pretty tops uh, for if I ever decide to go back into an office setting where I need to look more professional again, because I like that version of myself. You know, I want to be a, a successful person who looks good and put together. And so sometimes there's that urge there to add to my wardrobe for things that like I don't necessarily want to wear on the daily, but that represent a future that I want to have before I have it. And that brings me to my next point that I will ask you about. I think Lorelai does this, um, but she does it in sort of an opposite direction. Like her version of fantasy self is not what you might expect. So like, what would you say Lorelai's sort of fashion choices, especially in the early seasons, I would say, like seasons one and two, she's a lot more funky. So where do you think that comes out of? Like, why does she dress the way she does? Lorelai's sort of eclecticness with some of her ensemble choices in the earlier seasons just stem from, again, and we talked about this before, she really didn't have the opportunity to have like, those active teenage years and those college years that most of us get. And so she, you know, when she was going to private school in high school, there was a uniform that was in place. She had to dress the same every single day. Even when she wasn't at school, I'm sure Emily and Richard appropriated outfits for her and told her, this is what we think is good for you to wear, what's appropriate for you to wear. She probably wasn't allowed that creativity within the Gilmore household while she was there to experiment and make her own fashion choices. So I think that now that she has the opportunity to do it, even as someone in her late 20s going into her, into her early 30s, some of those fashion choices to us may seem a bit juvenile, but I think it's just a case of her making up for lost time, to be honest. Yeah, I didn't think about that. I read it more as a complete rejection of everything her mother is. You know, like she wants to express herself with funky clothing and have it say something about her beliefs and values being the complete opposite of Emily's because Emily is classy and elegant and straight laced and conservative. And so are her friends. Right. And so Lorelai showing up in a t-shirt that has a kitty with rhinestones on it would be completely horrifying to them. It's kind of in the same vein as the pop tart rant, you know, where she's like, do I like what I like or do I only like it because I think it would piss off my mom? <laughs> and so I always read it as that, but I really like that take because you're right. It's sort of like a reclaimed youth and girlhood that she didn't really get because she got pregnant so young. I really think that's a big part of it now that you mention it. Yeah. And I think, you know, over time she kind of falls out of it and she grows out of it, which is par for the course because we all do like, I certainly would never wear the same things now that I would wear when I was 15, perhaps even when I was 20. Um, you know, our fashion choices are going to change. We're going to feel comfortable wearing different things like, you know, 
there's an evolution with that that's going to take place. And I feel like for Lorelai, perhaps it was just a bit delayed again by the fact that, you know, she was hit early in life with, you know, things that perhaps stunted her and having those realization in terms of, you know, what she's going to like, what she's going to love, what is going to be comfortable for her, what's going to be appropriate as we see her move through the seasons. And especially as she starts, uh, you know, more actively dating, um, you know, she dresses well for the dates that she goes on. Again, going back to what I said, she always dresses well for work. Um, I don't feel she's ever necessarily dressed inappropriately other than Lorelai's first day at Chilton. But, you know, do your laundry, folks. That's all I can say. Just keep up with it. Um, but she comports herself well. She presents herself well. And over time, um, I don't. I would never say she gets to, like, the level of style that I feel like, you know, Emily has. But she has some pretty quality outfits over time. I agree. You're you're definitely right. In the early seasons, she's so casual, just like t-shirt or long sleeve tee and jeans and bandanas, a lot of bandanas. Um, and then matching suits at work. And so she has these two very different selves. She has to be the, the put together mom manager self. But then when she's kind of just at home with Rory, she gets to be a little more casual, laid back, youthful in her dress. So that's very true. Um, I find it interesting in um, Deer Hunters, when she spills the coffee on herself and has to put on the B-52s t-shirt that's in the car. It feels like a merging of the wor worlds because she's wearing a casual band tee under a suit. And it's like the the put together Lorelai and the, the clumsy <laughs> kind of childish Lorelai who isn't perfect and doesn't have it all together. It's like the, the worlds colliding in her outfit there. And, you know, speaking of dating, it's when she's flirting with Max Medina and he's like, you B-52s girl? Like it, it's a point of conversation for them that comes out of that, that fashion misstep moment, right? So that's an interesting one. And you also alluded to um, Lorelai's first day at Chilton. So let's talk about that a little bit more because I think that is just by far one of the most iconic <laughs> fashion moments and it's only the second episode. So my question is like, how is your wardrobe so far gone that when your good stuff is at the cleaner, you can't do any better than a tie dye pink t-shirt, shorts and Daisy Dukes, especially like we never, or sorry, shorts and cowboy boots. Shorts and Daisy Dukes are the same thing, Kate. Come on. Um, <laughs> we never see her wear shorts again. <laughs> like, it's the only time. Even in summer episodes, she's always wearing jeans or pants or skirts of some sort. And, like, we never see those shorts again. And then in um, the Concert Interrupt Us episode, we see her cleaning out her closet. I'm like, how could, did you not have anything better than this? And why couldn't you borrow from Rory? That was going to be my answer to your question. Um I think first and foremost, it just stems from wanting to allow for comedic writing and a comedic scene, you know, so, you know, the writers are falling back on like, oh, we missed several laundry days at this point. We did not upkeep it, upkeep with it whatsoever. Um, we slept in way too late, got up later than we needed to. Now we're scrambling to get to work. And I mean, who amongst us hasn't been there? Like, you know, when you're just trying to get out the door at the start of the day and you're just like scrambling to like, what do I have that's clean? What can I throw on? We've, we've all been there. Um, I think that's who's true for all of us. us. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Who's amongst us. Um, but at the end of the day, I would, yeah, I, I, I don't think I would ever fall into that situation where I would be going to work or dropping off my child at the first day of school, wearing something that is, potentially that inappropriate. Um, even if I wasn't wearing something that was necessarily business related or business casual or appropriate for the situation that I'm in, for her to default to having to throw that on, I think just stemmed from the writers needing, you know, a comedic arc to that sort of part of the episode. Um, 
but my first, my, my next thought too, was always just like, well, you share clothes with Rory. It's very apparent that you do because you have an entire scene debating about whose boobs are bigger. And in the next gonna, episode. <laughs> yeah. And who's going to stretch out a shirt more. And I can't let you borrow my shirt because your boobs are going to stretch it out. You obviously have shared clothes in the past. It seems like you're still willing to do so now. If you, Lorelai, were that, like, you know, in the heat of the moment, just being like, I don't have anything to wear, you know, go hit up your daughter's closet. You two are relatively similar in body size and composition, if not identical. I'm sure you can find something that Rory has clean in her closet that would be appropriate for you to put on, even if it's just like a skirt, you know, a, a pair of like slacks that maybe don't fit you perfectly, but fit you well enough, like a blouse. There had to have been something. So I think it just stemmed from the writers just throwing us a comedic arc to that episode. And I'm not mad about it because it was funny. Yeah, it's definitely funny. And I think, you know, sometimes I have to remind myself it's just not that serious. <laughs> um, and it's not all supposed to make sense necessarily. It's one thing if it's like, okay, this is truly really dumb because like it makes no sense. I think it is supposed to be one of those really early indications to us that Lorelai is a bit of a hot mess, you know, in the fun way where she has these things in her wardrobe to begin with and she doesn't have it all together. She, you know, has this veneer of maturity and adulthood and capability that um, falls apart sometimes and um, will inevitably lead to some embarrassment when it comes to her daughter and her mother. So it's just a really early indication of her um, her personality and her brain space being, you know, full of weird, scary gibberish and just it not always being 100% there and with it. Yeah. I, I will follow, it up, follow us up with this question, which is related, but not, but something I want us to start getting into as we break down the characters of who does it best, who does it worst. Who do you think ever dressed better? Lorelai or Rory? Ooh. Oh, early seasons, Rory, later seasons, Lorelai. Well, I don't know. Rory has some pretty big missteps, but I do love all of her, like, tweed. <laughs> the big fan of tweed. Um, I love that dark academia vibe. Um, but I love, in the later seasons, Lorelai's sort of, the evolution of her suiting. When she becomes her own boss, she starts wearing, like, nice tailored suits and pretty blouses and beautiful dresses and... And so her, I think her looks in the later seasons are more stylish. Um, although there are some pieces of Rory's that I'm really into. But I do quite like Rory's casual wardrobe when she's a little bit younger. When, you know, she wears a lot of the like bell-bottom cords and just simple sweaters and long sleeve tees and just has a very like warm, comfortable look to her. Um, it feels small town and very appropriate for her lifestyle and her her personality and some of Lorelai's looks in the early seasons are absolutely outlandish. Like when she gets that sweater and the hat from the rummage sale and it's just, it's too much. Like they're making her too quirky with it. Whereas Rory just looks normal, <laughs> but eventually, like you said, she matures and she evolves to that place where even her more casual outfits are elevated and polished and, sophisticated in a way that they weren't when she was still sitting on her floor surrounded by stuff out of the fridge being like rah, rah. <laughs> right wait hang on so. is, is, Li is lily around <laughs> lily? Yeah, i took i took that from her um yeah no it's the the fridge makes a noise and she's sitting on the floor and it's you know kind of messy and that's the point like her her wardrobe is cobbled together probably from stuff she picked up at the thrift store or some sort of fast fashion store aimed at kids like teens you know um again because she can share clothes with rory she could still fit into that kind of stuff because she's so slim but um yeah and then in the revival i think they're both spot on i loved basically all of the fashion and costuming in the revival i think they knocked that out of the park and i want like everything that they were <laughs> Stars Hollow Clothier and other places online where you can get it, folks. Um, yeah, I, I agree. Uh, as they matured, their fashion choices definitely grew with them. Uh, 
I became envious of a lot of what they had on. So they did very well with it. Um, I do want to lead us into talking about a few other people on the show who I think mm -hmm. either hit or missed the mark with some of their uh, ensemble pieces. Um, is there anyone specifically that you would like to lead us to next? Or did you have any other thoughts on Lorelai and Rory? I have more on Lorelai. I feel like she's going to be our biggest one and the other ones will be a little bit quicker. But there are at least two more things that I want to talk about in terms of her fashion choices. The first being the fact that um, in Lorelai Out of Water, she goes out and buys a whole new outfit for fishing, even though she knows nothing about it and doesn't care about it because she wants to try to impress Alex. And it's just like one of the few times that we actually see her dressing for a man instead of dressing for herself. And I just thought it was a really interesting moment for her. And, you know, if you think about it, she doesn't do the same thing with Luke. You know, she doesn't mm -hmm. offer to go fishing with him or get all dressed up for him because she's so comfortable with him that she doesn't have to, like, feel like she's putting on a facade. And so with Alex, I feel like she's using her fashion choices as a way to communicate interest and um, and, and trying to connect with it in a way that she rarely does. Do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, I think it was, I like, I have mixed feelings about that because it's good to want to, you know, dress appropriately for the occasion. I wonder if she was trying to default too much and trying to make herself too appealing to Alex at that point and just being like, I'm your model girl. I'm your model girlfriend um, and comport herself too much into what Alex might want to see in her, but not necessarily who she is. Um Again, granted, like she was going fishing, so it is, I guess, a sort of outdoor endeavor that does require a certain um, fashion choice and and attire choice, and you know, to make sure that you're comfortable and that you're dressed appropriately for potentially even just you know going knee deep in water and and getting wet and and you know, it, you know, being in that sort of environment, but it. I don't know if she was trying to, again, maybe make herself too much of what Alex wanted to see. But then I also contrast it with, we all know Lorelai. I mean, I think at the end of the day, she's the type of person where if it will afford her the opportunity to let her go shopping and acquire a new outfit, she's going to do it. Yeah. So maybe I think it was also probably largely a lot of that where it's just like, I get to swipe the credit card and I ain't mad about it. Yeah, I'll do anything if I can buy an outfit. <laughs> she even says that. So yeah, I think, I mean, I'm kind of the same way where she's like, oh, I'm going to go do this thing and I'm get the going to get the exact perfect outfit for this occasion. So relatable. Um, and yeah, I think there's a lot of instances where women especially will dress to impress men instead of dress to please themselves. But you're right, this particular occasion is kind of a little more specific and it, it did require certain clothing. So it kind of could be read either way, which is interesting. Um, and I have one more Lorelai specific thing. So this is a very contentious issue and we're gonna see how this lands. Mm -hmm. Lorelai's bridesmaid, like maid of honor dress from the vow renewal, love it or hate it. I love it because I have to think it's what she wanted because I don't see Lorelai putting on something that is going to, again, be not her, not representative of her, something that is going to make her uncomfortable or even just be displeasing to her. Um, there is a certain extent and modicum to which I think Lorelai can extend a sort of like selflessness with attire. And I think that, maybe with that particular dress, she was trying to just say like, I'm just going to suck it up and grin and bear it. But I think if it was something that like Lorelai is very opinionated and she's very, she's always been very forward with what she likes and doesn't like. So I feel like if this was something where she took one look at it and was just like, no, I'm not going to wear that. She would have very explicitly said like, no, I'm not putting that on. I'm not going to wear it. So I, I don't necessarily love it in terms of like, I don't think that's like the greatest, you know, outfit or dress that I've ever seen, but I think she looks good enough in it. And if she's willing to put it on and be comfortable in it and, you know, at the end of the day, like that's 
somewhat what matters, but what do you think? Yeah, I take it as Lorelai picked it out and Emily approved it, which is interesting because you would think that Emily wouldn't approve something like that, but it's like a silvery blue, which kind of plays off of Emily's silvery suit that she's wearing. So it, it's sort of a close enough nod to that, but it's got more blue in it, which is a color I associate with the Gilmore Girls. So it's almost like Lorelai plus Emily um, agreeing on this outfit and sort of like being harmonious right before the storm. You know, for a brief moment here, we had some concordance and some agreement and some pleasant interactions and then it all goes to hell. But just the, the color of it is, I feel symbolic of that. And I actually don't hate the bolero. Like a lot of people don't like her little like magenta sequin shrug. But I think, you know, in 2005, shrugs were all the rage. So it was very of its time. It, it hasn't dated the best, but it was very popular. She wore other similar things at the time. And so I don't hate it. And um, my main gripe with it is the fabric. Lauren Graham can pull off anything. She's got like a perfect figure. And so it has nothing to do necessarily with like it making her look bad. But the fabric was so stiff that like if you watch how it moves when she dances, it really like bunches up in an unflattering way that it shouldn't. And I think that has to do with, I, it looks very sort of like stiff and almost not quite plasticated, but like, I don't even know how to describe it. I, I'm not a textile expert, but I can tell that the problem with it is not the cut, it's not the fit, it's the fabric. And so I love the little like fluttery hem on it. And it's, it's so well fitted up top, but that middle section is, destroyed by the fact that they picked the wrong fabric to make that dress out of. They they could have gone with something else that had a little more movement to it and it would have been stunning. Yeah, I hadn't thought about that. Um, but you're right. Uh, the dress needs to fit. It needs to look well. Um, I'm like replaying that scene in my mind now. Um, yeah, I can see how perhaps it wasn't the best choice in terms of fabric, but again, just bouncing off of what you said, like Lauren Graham's figure and just like that woman's bone structure is unreal. So I feel like no matter what you put her in, she was probably always going to look badass no matter what. Yeah. Speaking of badass though, and, uh, <laughs> Lauren Graham, um, you know, I don't want to objectify people too much. She has a perfect mind. <laughs> but there's one outfit she wears that I think is one of her worst fashion moments. Right up there with the, like, pink flat cap outfit. I can't remember what episode it's from. It's from, like, season three or four. Awful. <laughs> but it's in Sadie Sadie when she's deciding, um, like, whether or not she wants to say yes to Max's proposal. And she's wearing that sort of, like, it's got a blue with a dog and then little like red cap sleeves and the black jeans with the like cross stitching on the butt I'm like maybe it's just a me thing you may disagree with me but those jeans are heinous <laughs> yeah I mean I don't disagree and I think um actually I know I've sent you this before it was like months ago so I don't know if you would remember but it's relevant now it is that particular top with the dog on it was actually a top that was worn by um, Miranda and Lizzie McGuire. And just the fact that, again, that top was used by a teenager in Lizzie McGuire when they were 14 or 15 years old, again, I think speaks to what we alluded to before with um, Lorelai's fashion choices, where I think sometimes she was just reverting back to a, a sort of like teenage self where it's like, I never got to wear things like this because imagine her putting on that outfit and then trying to walk out the door, not, not necessarily a school because she had a uniform, but just trying to walk out of the door in general, you know, while she was still living with Emily and Richard, I could see them just being like, first off, where did you get that? Because we did not buy it for you. We never <laughs> approved you purchasing that top and you're going to leave the house in that. Excuse me. What is that? She probably never got to wear things like that. And 
for a woman of her age, yeah, maybe a little bit misplaced, misguided, you know, but for a preteen or a teenage girl, it's like, of course, you're going to wear a shirt like that. That's, you know, that that falls in line with like the age that you're at. And, you know, perhaps like a more in line stylistic choice for a preteen or a teenage girl. So I think it was just maybe again, her just being like, I never got to wear stuff like this. And so I think it's cute and I'm going to put it on and zero F's given. Yeah, I find it interesting that they do put her in such a youthful outfit when she's contemplating a marriage proposal. It's like a subtle, um, yeah, she's really not ready for this. She's looking at bridal magazines while wearing jeans that would be worn by like a 16-year-old right now. Like Rory's peers would probably be wearing this. It starts hollow high, you know, and, uh, and here she is thinking about getting married. So, yeah, I guess that covers like, a lot of Lorelai's big moments. So now I'm happy to move on. Why don't we move on to Rory? What do you think? Let's start from the beginning. What do we think of the Moo Moo? Like, what does the Moo Moo say about Rory? Again, I think Rory kind of fell victim to the same things that Lorelai did, where maybe a bit too slow to grow up or too slow to experiment with like fashion choices. Um, you know, especially if, Lorelize your inspiration for how you're going to dress. And, you know, if you're sharing clothes or whatever, and, you know, your mom is again willing to walk out of the house one morning to take you to school and Daisy Dukes and a tie dye pink tee. Um, what standards do you have? I feel like Rory was a maybe, I don't even know if I would say that she was a bit more individualistic with her styling choices because I feel like Rory at the end, at the end of the day, perhaps even cared less about how she looked than Lorelai did where, you know, Rory was just very much, you know, I'm not going to walk out of the house looking like trash every single morning, but I'm just going to like always be comfortable. So if I want to roll out in a sweater and, you know, track pants one morning, not that she ever did that, I feel like she would have. And I think it was just more so for her about just being like, I don't really care how necessarily other people see me as much as long as I'm comfortable. So I think that particular sort of choice kind of fell in line with that thinking. Yeah. I think part of it was modesty. She really wasn't like looking to age herself up or sexualize herself. She was inexperienced with boys. And so she was just like, yeah, still living in that kind of, um, young, immature stage of, you know, this is what's appropriate to wear for someone of my age, kind of um, be covered up. Don't be too flashy. Don't be too, um, like, don't show off too much. Um, and Lorelai even makes fun of her. She's like, you worried about people with x-ray eyes? Like, <laughs> what is with the, like, extreme cover-up of this? And it continues, um, basically good forever. Like she never really wears anything that's like crazy. Uh, it, then again, it was the WB. So of course she's not going to wear anything too nuts. Um, it's supposed to be family friendly folks. Um, but, you know, I think to that moment where she gets her, her skirt for Chelton and she puts it on and it's like way too long on her and very unflattering. And, and she's like, fine, you can hem it a little. <laughs> You know, she doesn't want to show off too much leg. She often wears tights with her uniform. And she also talks with Lane about the uniform in the first episode being like, you know, we get to wear uniforms and like everyone looks the same. It's not about what you wear. People are just there to learn. And it really shows that she's less concerned with conforming and fitting in and um, playing into trends. And she's very studious and focused and her her attention and her energy are going to be focused on her academia instead of keeping up with, you know, the sparkly nail polish girls. Yeah. How do you think if it did at all that Rory's fashion choices and attire changed over time, stemming from her interactions now being a part of Emily and Richard's lives and sort of like getting her feet wet into like, oh, the nicer, finer aspect of things and like 
you know, the rich sort of things and being able to afford maybe clothes or accessories or, uh, you know, handbags that might not, you know, come into existence as much when she was living with Lorelai and, you know, under more modest financial means. Do you think that her fashion choices and attire changed at all because she was, you know, now able to experience more luxurious things and afford them? Or did it just not affect her at all? I wouldn't say not at all, but maybe not to the extent that you would expect. You know, she still had fairly down to earth fashion choices. Maybe she was just more aware of how things fit her and um, and how to choose quality fabrics and quality pieces that are gonna last. Um, but you can still see her in seasons th four through seven wearing fairly casual clothing, very like preppy, classic, demure outfits for the most part. Um, there are obviously some notable moments where Emily is very specific, like input on her outfit is relevant, like in the debutante ball episode and in the, the party's over with the male yell party when she's like, oh, what a lovely dress. Why don't I just take you upstairs where my makeup artist is waiting and I'm gonna cover you in diamonds. Um, you know, sort of the, the molding of her image to fit what Emily wants to see for her and what that means for her lifestyle and her prospects and her, her marriage ability, the way she's perceived by men uh, very much at play in both of those situations. And so I think Oh, and then the Russian tea when she wants her to wear that little like pink mm -hmm. pinafore dress. Um, you know, so Emily tries to exert this influence over Rory's fashion choices to make her fit in and to make her suitable <laughs> for the, the upper crusty world that she wants Rory to inhabit. But I feel like Rory's personal sense of style and desire to be comfortable and normal and um, just simple a lot of the time, still wins out. And so Emily will get her hands on her when she can. But at the end of the day, like you said, Rory wants to be comfortable and she wants to like focus on dressing the part and looking appropriate. You know, I like the moments when she's asking Logan what to wear to her first day at the internship. She's like, I want to look newspapery and, but like not like I'm trying too hard. And then when she buys her first suit when she's about to graduate and just the, again, where fashion is a, a performance and it's, it's put on as a way for her to act the fantasy self out of being a journalist, being a serious newspaper woman. That's more important to her, I think, than the sort of like the, the glamor or the, um, the fashion, the trends that you would associate with Emily's world. Yeah. Um, I agree with all of that. I think Rory dressed well enough for, again, the level of comfortability for the jobs that she needed to have. And nothing was ever out of line. It was just scaled down. It wasn't ever anything that was just, you know, I'm wearing brand name this and I'm wearing brand name that and look at me and, you know, notice what I have going on because it's, you know, fashionista moment of the year or anything like that. Um, which leads me to want to, wanting to talk about Emily, unless you had anything else that you wanted to touch upon with Rory. Once again, I have yet another important point for Rory. Okay. Um, when we get to the revival, she is searching up and down the state and even in London for her lucky outfit, red dress, full skirt. So she spends all of this time that she could be preparing for job interviews or searching for new leads that aren't Condé Nast or writing something else on spec, doing any other things besides clinging to this idea of this one outfit that makes her feel confident. Any thoughts about her pursuit of the lucky outfit? Why? Like, it just doesn't track with me for her. Like, I understand wanting to acquire it in that moment if you feel like it was going to allow you that fortuitousness to, like, be successful in that regard. But 
just in terms of everything that we've always known about her, it, like, I just, again, the best way I can put it is just like, why are you doing that? Because that's not an action that I would necessarily foresee you taking. I wouldn't see you making that much of an effort in this regard um, because you've never seemed to have cared about anything like that this much. So it, I can't understand it now. It would be like, you know, Emily just being like, oh, you know, let's go thrifting because we need to save some cash this month. I would be like, excuse me, who are you? Like some actions just don't track and that one didn't for me either. But do you have a different take on it? Yeah, I thought it was a kind of a weird running gag. And like the dress wasn't like it was a cute dress, but it didn't feel like it was appropriate for job interviews and stuff like that. Like it, it felt almost more like a cute going out dress as opposed to this is my professional look. Um, so yeah, I thought it, she was focusing on the wrong things. It was like a almost like a coping mechanism or something where she's like, I can't control anything else. And so I need this like this comfort garment. <laughs> to to make me feel like the version of myself I want to be once again with like leaning on on fashion as a way to play a role that she desperately wants but can't quite grasp mm -hmm. okay I, I I lied I have one more just a quickie and it kind of plays back into the Emily and Richard question that you had from before the golf hat Ooh. Like that was such an interesting moment because it represented like something of Emily and Richard's world that Roy put on and it looked kind of bizarre with her outfit. Like she really looked like she didn't belong, but then you could see that she was actually having a good time with her grandpa. And then she has that fight about the stretching out of the sweater. So like kill me now is quite a few fashion moments. I just thought it was really interesting that it was sort of like an early visual marker of of that transition starting. Yeah. And I think especially with the golf hat and with that entire ensemble, I think for Emily and Richard, it was especially more so for Emily. I think it was just perhaps like, you know, we're getting the daughter and our granddaughter that we never had. Like, these are always things that we would, would have wanted to do with Lorelai. Like we would have loved to have taken her to the club and show her off to our friends and, you know, to do a round of nine or 18 with her. Um, you know, and to get her involved in that sort of atmosphere, but we never got to do it. So now that, you know, Rory is needing to take up a sport for the purpose of children, and she just, for whatever reason, chooses golf, God bless her. Um, you know, I think it was just, and it's, it's not the first instance we see it play out throughout, you know, pretty much the entire run of the show. I think it was just Emily getting in, Rory what she never got in Lorelai and just being like I never had to have these mother daughter moments so I'll at least be able to have these mother granddaughter moments and sort of try and make up for it in that regard yeah and on that note that's a perfect segue into talking about Emily in Wonderland when she comes to Stars Hollow and she literally walks a mile in Lorelai's shoes when she puts on the runners because her her heels are not great for kind of hoofing it around town. Um, so do you have any take on sort of Emily existing in Lorelai and Rory's world of comfort and simplicity and like everything not being so fancy and so proper all the time? Yeah. I mean, I think Emily would be remiss to ever admit it, but I feel like she enjoys and finds comfort in dressing down sometimes and not having to wake up every single morning and being like, I need to put on my face and I need to do my hair and I need to make sure that every outfit is new and fresh and something that I haven't worn within the last 30 days and is presentable and is going to make me look good again to perhaps my DAR women or any of Richard's business associates that I'm going to have to interact with today or anyone I'm gonna have to meet at a social engagement. There's such pressure there to have to constantly be on with how you look and how you present herself. And I think that Emily enjoyed doing it and she did genuinely, like, again, enjoy dressing up and shopping and having all of these new outfits and putting together all of these really beautiful ensembles because Emily dresses herself wonderfully. I'm jealous of her wardrobe 
any day of the week. Like, I just want to raid her closet and take all of her clothes. But I feel like for the moments where she can dress down and, you know, we see her do it in the Marie Kondo episode. I mean, granted, that's because I think in that episode, for several reasons, she had zero, you know, what's to give. Um, but I feel like she also does find comfort sometimes and just being like, oh, like, for the first time in 365 days, I don't have to care. And I think she finds it refreshing, even if she doesn't necessarily want to admit, even if she doesn't want to admit it, because it takes effort to have to do that every single day. And it can just be really tiring to even have to put forth that effort. So when she can get a reprieve from it, I think she's grateful to have it again, even if she doesn't want to own up to just being like, oh, I'm relieved wearing gym shorts and sneakers is really nice right now. Yeah. I mean, granted she is a corporate wife and so it is part of her role to get dressed up almost as if she's going into an office uh, and to maintain herself in such a way as many people who actually work outside the home do. So she has more time and energy to put into it than most of us do. Uh, ironically, and probably fewer people throughout the day get to see it, except maybe her hairstylist and her nail girl. And like you said, maybe some of Richard's business associates if they come for dinner. So that's interesting. But you touched on a really important thing that I want to continue talking about a little bit more, which is the revival when she is trying to declutter and she picks up that like fancy dress with the sequins and she's like, no joy. And she throws it away. And she's wearing like Lorelai's old candies t-shirt and a pair of jeans with a Billy Squire patch on the butt. And uh, she's like, she's found these to put on because they're comfortable and because none of her current clothes feel like her anymore. And so she's like run out of options and she's starting to evolve a little bit and start to reevaluate the rest of her wardrobe. And she eventually takes it so far as to go and move to Nantucket and become a docent at the Whaling Museum. And she slips out of her like classy, but still casual loafers into white canvas shoes. Like it, it's almost hearkening back to that, that sneaker moment where she's like, finally, I'm the one who um, can live this more laid back lifestyle. And I'm finally dressing to make myself happy and doing things for myself to make myself happy instead of always having to put on this facade of um to quote her from that epic dar meeting artifice and bullshit yeah i i love those moments um when we see emily come into her own and i think she really does it after she moves and after richard's passing um and there's a lot that i can and do want to talk about there I feel like that is more better served for an episode that we're going to do down the line on grief and loss, because I feel like a lot of those changes and a lot of those choices do stem from the grief that she feels from Richard's passing and how debilitating the loss of anyone can be, especially a spouse in that regard and how it can affect the effort that you're willing and able to put forth each and every single day. Um, and I think it really did alter her mindset in terms of, you know, I don't have to be responsible for entertaining Richard's business associates anymore. I don't have the same social obligations that I once did. I don't have to worry about that seven days a week anymore in the same way that I used to. So I can have the flexibility and the luxury of just being able to wake up on any given morning sometimes and just be like, you know what, if I just want to throw on like, you know, a blouse and some jeans, I can. And I don't have to worry about it anymore because I'm not trying to impress in the same way that I was anymore. And I think that was also a really good, like, just mental clarity moment for her when she was able to have those days where she's like, I can just be me today and I don't have to worry about being presentable for someone else I can just exist and be comfortable in my own skin and in the way that I want to in this moment and have my fashion choices and my attire reflect that now yeah one last shout out I mean there might be more 
Oh wait, okay, two last shout outs. Um, the red suits in Like Mother, Like Daughter, epic. I love that, you know, we get this moment where they're they're sharing something and it's a fashion moment, literally at a fashion show. Um, I thought that was sweet. And then another standout Emily moment is, speaking of grief and loss, in The Reigning Lorelei, when she finds out that Trix has tried to, um, like, tried to get Richard to leave her at the altar. Mm -hmm. And she just goes rogue and has what Kelly Bishop likes to call her Tennessee Williams moment. And she just wears that floral robe and yeah. drinks and smokes all day. I'm like, it's just one of the first times you really see Emily unbuttoned a little bit. Like, she lets her guard down and in a moment when she's supposed to be prim and proper and and doing things in a respectful manner, she just loses it and is like, no, I'm going completely the opposite direction. <laughs> yeah. But again, she needed to have those moments. I don't love that it took, obviously, moments of trauma or stress or duress from an in-law or the passing of a loved one for her to achieve that. But I do see, and there was a transition between how she attired herself before and after and after Richard's passing. So there's something to be said to that. Again, more that I will touch on in our grief and loss episode. All right. I feel like those are our big ones, but I have like a whole list of like small shout outs that are very like key costuming moments that convey a lot to the audience without you even like kind of below the surface that well actually one is a little more substantial but like the rest of them are kind of subtle but let's talk briefly about lane and her double dressing yeah i mean it, it saddens me because mrs kim put you know such innate pressure on her to exist and comport herself in such a certain way where if she wasn't up to her standards, I mean, look at some of the end results that we actually see play out. Like, you know, you get kicked out of the house, you get grounded and you're not allowed to leave, you know, um, no phone time, no internet time, whatever other um, implementations Mrs. Kim would have put into place for uh, Lane breaking the rules in that regard, they were there. And so it just, Lane was never ever truly able to fully express herself while she was under Mrs. Kim's roof. She tries to with, you know, her secret closet with what she has under the floorboard, but those aren't even necessarily fashion choices as much as like just a general want of expression in another regard. But she's only ever able to really wear what she wants to when she's out of the house. And then when she's getting ready to go back to the house, she has to take off a shirt that she's wearing because it's not Mrs. Kim approved. She can't enter the household in that way. Um, you know, it's, it's just, it saddens me because it's so diminishing for any parent, I think, to do that to any child. You know, it's not like she was rolling up wearing something that was like very scantily clad or like largely inappropriate or suggestive in nature for someone of her age as a teenager, you know, she was just perhaps wanting to wear a rock and roll t-shirt, but she couldn't because her mother was so strict in that regard and would just be like, excuse me, what is that? You're not leaving the house for a year. And so it really stunted Lane. And we see how that plays out over the coming years where, you know, they are able to sort of mend their relationship in that regard. Um, and she's able to become more expressive as she, you know, grows, old, you know, out of those teenage years and becomes an adult. But she should have been allowed to do that from the start. And I wish that Mrs. Kim would have allowed her that flexibility. But of course, we know that was never going to happen. Yeah, it's an interesting representation of her her competing interests where she wants to be herself and she wants to express the things that she loves and is passionate about, but she also wants to respect her mom and her mom's wishes. And so she characteristically hides this other side of herself that just wants to rock, you know? So uh, you're right. It's sad. It's, it's unfortunate. And it, 
probably similar to what Lorelai was doing, maybe, you know, maybe she leaves the house in her, her uniform, but brings an extra set of clothes for after school where, you know, if Emily had seen them, she was going to chew Lorelai out for it. Uh, and then she'll just put her uniform back on and go home. You never know. But it's, again, one of those ways that costuming is used on the show to tell us something about a relationship and about Lane's character and her her desires overall. Mm -hmm. uh, let's talk about Paris and her first date with Tristan. What do you think of her coming to Rory, of all people, for fashion advice? It's interesting because, you know, obviously I'm surprised that she didn't go to Madeline or Louise who are obviously, you know, would have been in my mind a much more like, you know, why don't you go to them? They're obviously like more fashionable. They could have advised you better on outfit choices. Um, when you're going to a party, you're trying to impress a guy that you have a crush on. Um, but she obviously just went to Rory in that moment because that was who she trusted as a best friend at that time, even above Madeline and Louise to be like, you know, perhaps like not everyone knows that I'm crushing on Tristan. And even if Madeline and Louise did know, you know, that's a very like, you know, having crushes as a teenager, like that's a very, you know, it's, you're treading new ground. You're trying to figure out like how to approach new relationships. Like, you know, what's it, going to take to try and, you know, get the guy to make the other person like you. So I think it was just a matter of coming to Rory because she trusted her more in that moment than she did Madeline and Louise, even if those two could have advised her better from a fashion perspective. But I think Rory still did well with just being like, I hear what you're saying. I know you like this guy. Let's try putting you in this. Let's try having you wear this, you know, see how you look. And I think she counseled her well. Yeah. She even, like, Rory asked her that question. Like, why didn't you go to Madeline or Louise about this? And she's like, because, like, you know, yeah, they're good with fashion and lipstick. But they're not good with, like, the other side of stuff. The emotional support. And the, like, they're not going to be what I need to hear for emotional support in this moment. And I love how they raid Lorelai's closet. And then, you know, the clothes are kind of used as... uh leverage and vengeance almost when Paris thinks that Rory has betrayed her with Tristan. She's like, oh, I think that's, you know, the clothes that the dog had her puppies on. <laughs> You'll never see them again kind of thing. Oh, um, so low blow, Paris, low blow. But yeah, it's sad that she kind of, well, I don't know if she considered Rory a best friend yet, but she was certainly on the way. And you're right, there was some trust there and some recognition of a skill set that Rory had when it comes to being supportive of Paris that other friends just seem to lack over the years. Yeah. And it's nothing on Madeline and Louise, like they're wonderful people and they're very solid friends. And, and, you know, that was a really nice friendship for them to have. But I, I think it was just, again, stemming from at that point, I think you alluded to it perfectly. Um, Paris needed more than just, you know, a fashion choice at that point. I think she did need that level of emotional support that she was not going to receive from Madeline and Louise. So it was twofold. Like I need to look good tonight to impress the guy, but I also need, you know, a potential emotional wing woman and Rory is going to be able to be that for me. Yeah. Speaking of wing woman, Suki and her fashion choices. Uh, my question to you is why did we ever think dresses over pants was a good look? I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Suki's fashion is fairly different, I think, because she's always wearing her sort of like chef's jackets. And anytime she's not, it's sort of like the same couple of items. She doesn't have as much variety in her costuming as some of the other characters do. And I'm wondering if part of that was the fact that it was the early 2000s and she was on the like larger side for actresses and maybe they just felt like they didn't have as many options for larger bodies, which is sad and gross. I will say, I just, I laughed at that comment to preface, not at the larger body side, but just because I flash back to my own fashion choices 
as a preteen in the early aughts and knowing what fashion was and what was out there and available and choices like that. Yeah, mm. we missed the mark a lot of the time. I don't know what I, we were doing. And yet it's coming back, you know? And, it doesn't need to. We can it can die. No. I mean, I even, oh my gosh, I was in a, I was in a store the other day and I saw like an entire display of like overalls fashion. And I'm just like, but why? I mean, I can kind of get on board with overalls. I think they can be cute if they're styled appropriately, but like some things I'm just like, why do we do this to ourselves? This is not flattering. It's like, no, no. Yeah. Including dresses over pants. Like, why did we think that was a thing? Liz does it a lot too. Yeah. I mean, individuality is always something to be considered with fashion choices. Like at the end of the day, everyone's going to, again, dress in a way that speaks most to them. And so I'm reticent to judge anybody, nor do I think we should really ever for most fashion choices, because again, you're wearing what you want to wear. Um, but I think there needs to be perhaps a balance with it between and then this is where I think it's it's good to have like either like a parent or a partner or even just like a friend, you know, whether it's, you know, girlfriends or guy friends just being like, you may want to rethink that. I don't know how wise of a fashion choice that is. And it's not a judgment. It's just I think there's a level of balance between just advising people that you care about like, hey, no judgment, but doesn't look super great maybe consider this instead yeah and i mean there's another side to that too which we didn't touch on earlier when we were talking about scene in a mall and about lorelei like I, I think about that episode where she shows up in a dress she's worn before and emily's like i've seen you wear that a dozen times like why don't you update your wardrobe so it's not so much that she's criticizing the dress but she's criticizing lorelei's re-wearing of the dress so much and thinking well, obviously you should go and spend money and update your wardrobe because it's inappropriate to be seen so many times in one outfit. And so, you know, there's a level of, you know, protecting people from their their own bad decisions when it comes to fashion. And then there's the pressure that we feel to meet certain standards in terms of not wearing the same thing twice and um, just constantly having something new. And so I think that's a big side of things too and maybe that goes into the whole fashion thing where it's just like well i have this thing and this thing so what if i wore them together and then it looks like a different thing or a new thing right it's sort of like a, a new way to repurpose existing items in your wardrobe i don't know that's the only justification i can give it because there is nothing else it's like not a good look why did we do it i got nothing for you there <sighs> yeah all right, let's move on to someone whose fashion was very stable over the course of the series, who had the least interesting fashion arc of all time. Oh, I know who you're going to. But still had a significant moment with an accessory, or a few set significant moments. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about Luke. You know, he's that, that stable, unchanging, comfortable character who's just rugged and masculine. And he starts out wearing a hat and Lorelai gives him a new one. He wears it for many years until they break up. And then he gets a Connecticut Defenders hat. What's your take on the whole like Luke expressing his feelings through his hats? <laughs> um, I think in general to, to start off Luke's attire in terms of how it was pretty much the same day in and day out. I think is just meant to be a direct reflection of his personality and the life that he has in stars hollow, which is to say that like, he's comfortable in stars hollow. He's not going to move. He's never going to change. It is what it is for him. This is his life. This is how he wants to live it. And this is where he's going to end up. There are no changes that are going to be made. We've talked about this, you know, in previous episodes, I don't foresee Luke ever leaving Stars Hollow because he's just comfortable there and that's his livelihood and that's where, um, you know, his business is. And I think his wardrobe is meant to be some sort of correlation to that where it's like, I don't feel the need to change. I don't want to change. 
this is how I'm comfortable. So I'm not going to. I feel like perhaps the baseball caps were just, you know, maybe a little bit more directive of relationships coming into his life. And then just, um, especially with Lorelai, you know, if that woman gives him that woman, Lorelai could give him like the ugliest effing baseball cap in the world. Let's be honest. And he would probably just be like, I'll wear it because Lorelai gave it to me. Um, but at the end of the day, again, I think his outfit choices were just outfit choices because again it was the same thing every single day i think it was just always meant to be a correlation of this is who luke is and he's not going to change in terms of his lifestyle in terms of his outfit choices and anyone who's going to be a part of his life again whether it was ever going to be rachel or nicole or lorelei or another woman was always going to have to just fall in line with that and be okay with it yeah, speaking of Rachel, she kind of goes along with the whole, like, um, the 2000s are back <laughs> kind of thing. Because I feel like a lot of what she wore is sort of having a resurgence, you know, like that effortless cool girl thing where you wear a flannel and a leather jacket and an oversized pair of jeans. It's very much the look right now. And it's interesting that, you know, we're introduced to her through a piece of clothing as well. Um, it, it's sort of a symbol that Luke holds on to of this woman who left a real impression on him and who he clearly still holds a bit of a flame for. And so then when he sees it on Lorelai, he just absolutely loses it. And, you know, the, the sweater itself is just so, so casual. And then you see her, her actual style, you know, like down to earth and comfortable and effortless in a way that, Laurel, I kind of never is. Yeah. Again, I, I, I think it's just Rachel was always kind of might be maybe more like Rory in that regard where it's like, I don't really, I'm not going to leave the house looking like trash, but who am I looking to impress? My individuality is more important to me than how other people perceive me. So I'm going to dress in a way that is comfortable to me. Whereas Lorelai had moments of, you know, I care about how people look. I definitely have some missteps with attire in terms of it being too juvenile and maybe not aligning with the age that I'm at right now or dressing appropriately for that. But I feel like Rachel, Rachel was very comfortable just in her own skin. Again, just being like, I'm going to put on what I want to put on in the morning. And if anyone else has a problem with it or wants to judge me for it or thinks I look bad. I probably don't give a, you know what? Yeah. Another fashion related moment with Luke Lorelai and Rachel is when uh, he gives Lorelai his credit card to go buy her a gift. And she comes back with a bunch of clothes for him and tries to like dress him so that he's got, you know, some more date appropriate attire in his wardrobe and then he ultimately ends up wearing that stuff quite a bit whenever he kind of has more dressy occasions so you see that despite the fact that he's like did nobody at that mall notice you were having some sort of psychotic episode <laughs> he still kept that clothing um and and took Lorelai's advice and expertise into consideration in in wearing that stuff and um then Rachel walks in on her dressing him and is like, this is weird. And she starts to get the vibe that uh, there's something more going on there beneath the surface that needs to be dealt with. And so it's sort of like the beginning of the end for them a little bit. And um, one last thing that I think I want to pull up with Luke is um, Liz's wedding and what he wears there. And, you know, he's sort of like trying to debate between the ties and Jess is the one who tells him to go with the burgundy. And then at the end of the episode, it comes back and he's saying goodbye to him. And he's like, the tie was perfect. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, how do you feel about that moment on him advising him of it? And do you feel like Luke was ever in need of that course correction or was it justified or was it out of line for him to do that? Um. I think Luke was just so nervous in the moment that he was indecisive. I don't think he, like, I think both ties were attractive. Um, and ultimately the 
I liked that color on him and I think it went better with what Lorelai wore. And so there was something maybe that Jess was picking up on and, you know, we see Jess has something of a sense of style, I guess, more so in the later seasons. Like I really like what he wears to that, um, that open house at Trenchin. Um, early on, it's really just black jeans and Metallica t-shirts and um, that black leather jacket. But I, I just, I love that Luke is sort of indecisive and, and Jess is there for him in that moment and is like, I like the burgundy. And it's one of the few times we see Luke wear a tie at all in the series. So we know he doesn't like to dress up. He doesn't like to put on suits, but he wants to go out with Lorelai and there's this very special occasion. He's got to wear a suit. He's not quite sure what to do about it. And Jess kind of comes in solid and, and Luke praises him for it and thanks him and, and was like, because I think if memory serves, Lorelai is like, nice tie. Yeah. And, and so it's like that. That little moment of bonding. Now we see Luke and, and Jess um, burying the hatchet, if you will, after everything that happened in season three and early season four. Um, it's nice to see them kind of come back together over a tie. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's it's deeper than that, but like. <laughs> yeah. But sometimes, you know what? A small thing like that is going to do it. And that's just another example of how I think this show was written well, taking a fashion choice and like just a very minute and short-lived like just moment of like here's a piece of advice that's unrelated to what you have going on that's just more of like in line with a fashion choice but as a moment of bonding that i think allowed them to reconnect and start putting those pieces back together in that in that way so i'm here for it yeah speaking of ties richard gilmore is known for his signature bow ties let's talk about him real briefly there's like one particular fashion moment that i think we got to talk about and that's obviously the sequin vest. Mm. I love Emily's reaction to this. She's like, like um, when she's talking about the panic room and she's like, you know, I can't rely on Richard because he's so far away. It's like, your father wouldn't come to my rescue if I was on fire. Besides that vest of his is so loud, he wouldn't be able to hear me screaming. <laughs> I am here all day, every day for that vest. Um, <laughs> I thought it was fly. I think I like... <sighs> Not every person in life can pull off a bow tie. I think Richard did it constantly. I think just that's the best way I can put it. Like Richard was a fly dresser. Like, you know, I, I just think back to, you know, maybe dating back Richard a couple decades prior. Like I can see why Emily probably would have fallen for you. You were probably a very, you know, well-dressed classy individual. I think he upkept that in, um, the decades to come, you know, and that might have stemmed from, again, just his upbringing and uh, the business attire that he needed to maintain. Um, but I think he always dressed well. And then just, again, going back to that suit, like, you do you, Richard. And I think you were in that moment. And even if Emily doesn't want to be here for it, I'm here for it. Yeah, I think Emily probably did a lot of his shopping, too. So like, yeah, he probably was a nappy dresser just in terms of getting um, direction from his own parents. Um, but as he got married and was in adult life, it seems like Emily was sort of in charge of making those decisions on his behalf, knowing what he likes, knowing what his sizes are. Obviously, she goes into the mall and she's like, you have Richard Gilmore's measurements on file. I want like several Brioni suits in like every color. Just like just pull them, you know, like do mm -hmm. it. Um, so I think that was maybe her, uh, her area of expertise that he relied on in terms of his dressing. And, you know, it's kind of, he's a guy it's, you know, stereotypically there's a lot less in recent days. Fashion history is a whole other thing. Um, you know, the, the styles for men were very different, but modern men, unfortunately are less, exploratory with their fashion choices and so Richard was always very much just like a suit and tie kind of guy but seeing him with this vest brought out this other aspect to his his being we know he likes to sing and that he was in the whiff and poofs and whatnot and so seeing that he's now filling his time with a barbershop quartet and uh and all that like and Emily is concerned by it at first I have another quote about the vest. Our days never included Richard dressing up like that gay fellow whose tiger tried to eat him. I have definitely positively never seen this vest. This is a party vest. And I'm like, Emily, how is it a party vest? Who actually wears that vest to a party? And you've just likened it to a stage performer in an offensive way, of course. Um, 
don't love that part of it. It's still kind of funny, like not funny, but like gallows humor a little bit. I don't know. I'm sorry. It's I'm uncomfortable. Um, yeah, the she likens it to stage attire. And so it, she knows that he likes to sing. So I'm, I'm surprised that she didn't maybe make this connection of maybe he joined a singing group because this looks like a stage costume as someone who has been in acapella groups. Sometimes you just know where you're just like, you wear that on stage and never again, or nowhere else. Yeah, that's that's a good thought. I hadn't really considered that. And I wonder now that you said it, why she didn't make that association, especially considering his singing background. So touche, something I yeah. had never thought about. Yeah. A few more guys to touch on real quick. Not huge, important things, but like, and they're kind of related to each other. So Kirk and the gay bag, speaking of <laughs> homophobic references, um, and Zach in the silk dress that he wears to the Buddhist wedding. And just like, just the comments that are made about that. So like, again, on the topic of guys wearing anything that's sort of like outside of that very limited scope of what they're supposed to wear to look masculine and maintain that, that air of masculinity. Um, Kirk having a pink bag. Like, why did we ever decide that shoulder bags were only for women? when they're just like utility bags. I don't understand that. Like, I guess it comes down to pockets versus no pockets and clothing, <laughs> but- um, Maybe, but we're correcting that slowly yeah. but surely. We're getting there where men are starting to get more adventurous um, and and less gender bound in their, their fashion expression, which is a good thing. Um, but again, the show just like so plays into that where Kirk has Lulu's dog in Lulu's bag, and he's like, "Sorry, what's with the gay bag?" Okay. Um, okay. If L Woods is allowed to carry Bruiser around in a handbag, why can't Kirk Gleason? I rest okay. my case. Yep. And I've said. Yeah. Okay. And I've got three last shout outs. I just, I love Liz's wedding dress. Just that whole like Renaissance wedding vibe the like I look like Vanessa Redgrave in Camelot so perfect so beautiful Kathleen Wilhoyt looked amazing in that episode any thoughts on that yeah stunning that's like a dress that I don't think I would wear for that sort of occasion um maybe as like a you know cosplay outfit or like a a specifically tiered like event outfit if I was attending something like that but um it was very stylistic. It was very colorful. I feel like it suited Liz's personality, which is what I think at the end of the day, I'm always so excited to see with any costume choice is does that match your personality? Um, yeah. And in this case, that was Liz Danes all day, every day. And I mean, Kathleen just is a beautiful human being and she just pulled off that dress and that outfit super well. Yeah, it fit the theme. It fit her perfectly. It was quirky for, you know, someone who's on her like fourth marriage or something, you know, it doesn't have to be that classic white dress. So I think they knocked it out of the park with that choice. Yeah. Speaking of dresses and sort of looking vaguely bridal, uh, we also have Lindsay in that sort of like Marilyn Monroe white dress. I'm pretty sure it's in um, Say Goodbye to Daisy Miller right mm -hmm. at the very end kind of when, mm -hmm. um, if I could write is playing in the background and there's the montage of Rory packing for Europe and Lindsay making Dean dinner, um, you know, kind of returning to that, um, that idyllic fifties housewife kind of look, you know, it, it very much is evocative of Marilyn Monroe and sort of that, that fifties housewife aesthetic, but also young bride. Yeah. That dress for me was a bit of maybe like a like a borderline hard pass. I don't know if you would want to call it like a medium pass. Um, nothing on Arielle Kebble, uh, who again, just gorgeous person. Um, but I feel like that dress was probably more in line with something that her mother probably told her to wear or picked out for her. Um, or at least, you know, 
they they chose it together as opposed to what she might have would have wanted um it was traditional which is not bad um i'm not faulting that whatsoever but it just felt like it was not really ever her or what mm -hmm. her choice would have been and i feel like again just speaking to the young bride aspect of things um when you're getting married that young, it's not impossible to know what you want, but I feel like it was maybe a choice that was made hastily. And again, with the coercion of your mother, um, it didn't really feel like something that was her at the end of the day, if that makes any sense. In a way, it feels like Lindsay is trying too hard in that moment. And also simultaneously, the customers were almost trying too hard. Maybe not too hard, but like, it was one of those fashion illusions that was kind of on the nose. It was very apparent, It, which isn't necessarily a bad thing, but I think there was a lot more subtle costume work that had been done in other moments to convey things. And um, that one was just very much like prim, proper, young, naive, pure, good girl, um, 50s housewife. And I, you know, I guess it's not the worst thing that it was on the nose, but it just felt like one of those more like obvious choices that needed to be sort of picked apart a little bit. Yeah, I agree. Basic could have been better, not the worst, but it is what it is. Yeah. Again, I mean, it looks fine on her. I have no qualms with like the fit or the dress itself. It's more just like, if I see what you're doing there, you're maybe not doing it right, if that makes sense. Like, sometimes if it's too obvious that it's like, it takes you out of it a little bit when it's that obvious. Yeah. I, I concur. The illusion that they're going for. Yeah. Okay, and last but not least, I gotta shout out Sherry. She just she always looks so put together, and I love when they first meet her at that um, that debate. And um, Suki's like, her dress didn't wrinkle. She must be like a witch or something, <laughs> you know. Um, and then Sherry's response is, "Thanks, it's the fabric." <laughs> Circling back, Scotch guard, you know, just thing. Yeah. No, she, she's totally right. There are some fabrics that are just so much more supple that hold up to wear. And so you don't get all like wrinkly and creased when you sit down. And I try to buy as much of those things as possible so that I have less like noticeable fashion faux pas and, um, and high maintenance garments. And so I think that dress was so chic and sophisticated which is very Sherry, you know, again, very type A, very put together. And it's, it's smart of her to like know how to select fabrics that are, are going to hold up and are going to continue to look good through multiple washes and wears without needing like dry cleaning and ironing and steaming and, you know, all of these uh, time consuming care instructions because she's a busy girl. She's got a job to like focus on just way more into that but looking stylish is still important to her. So I'm like, very smart. I like that. Yeah. Do you think it stemmed from, again, we've talked about how, you know, dress can correlate with an upbringing. Do you think that Sherry was too maybe pompous with her attire choices? Or do you think it was just like, I guess, like, in line or fair with who she was. Because I feel like sometimes, and not singling out Sherry, but people can dress where it's like, you're just dressing to impress, but in a way where it's over the top and it's just, you need to scale it back. Did you ever get that sense from her? Or was it just like, no, she's good? No, I didn't get that from her. I think she always looked appropriate for what they were doing. And like I said, that dress was very elegant. It, it looked put together without being over the top. Like if I'm going to say someone's over the top and they're dressing too impressed and they're, they're just overdoing it again, I'm going to look at gossip girl or sex in the city. Like Carrie Bradshaw is the epitome of like, I'm going to like wear something outrageous to get attention. And 
not sure where that stems from. We know that Sherry, much like Rory, went to private school and therefore wore a uniform. And so she did mention some kind of backlash to that, um, not getting to choose her own wardrobe in her, her teen years and how her sense of style really came out of that. And I get that. I wore a, a Catholic school uniform for two years and, you know, shopping for college was a lot of fun because I finally got to wear real clothes again and, and carve out a style for myself that fit me in this new phase of life. And I've continued to upgrade and iterate since then. But I, I don't think she ever went overboard. We really only see her a couple of times. You know, we get that dress, which I think is perfect. You know, pair that with a blazer and you are work ready. But it also is casual. Like it's, it's a little fancy, but it's casual enough that she can get away with it as streetwear. And then we see her at her, uh, at her baby shower um, and that like green dress. And it's just, again, very, just very pretty, very casual. Like those dresses are still to this day, very popular, flattering dresses that are normal, basic, beautiful. Um, and then we see her in labor. So she's, you know, wearing a hospital gown, which is a little bit different. Um, I feel like there's one other instance where we see her, but maybe I'm wrong. Um, I don't think she ever goes over the top. I've seen over the top. Have you met Blair Waldorf and Serena Vanderwoodson? That's over the top. Uh, not as extensively as you have, but I have <laughs> met them once or twice. So that is true. I think I'm the one who introduced you to some of those episodes of Gossip Girl. You did indeed. Yeah, and Sex in the City, for that matter. I showed you the the episode where they go to Yankee Stadium. <laughs> yes, you did that too. The old Yankee Stadium, not the new one. Rip. Yeah, we had to do that because we were like going there a few days later. So yeah. It was perfect. Yeah. But that's my list. Do you have anything else that... Uh... Oh, wait. Just one shout out. We don't even really need to like talk about her necessarily. But Miss Celine. Got a shout out because she's, you know, yes. the fashion guru of the whole thing. Miss Celine. I, I would attempt the... I would attempt her accent and her nuances, but I would just embarrass myself. So I'm not going to. Uh, but yes. Um, dressing other people to impress, even as she continued to age, which is... In its own way, I guess, doing God's fashion work. So you go, Miss Celine. Four for you, Miss yeah. Celine. Four for you, Blood and Coco. Um, I like, there's a quote that maybe I should, I'm like, how do I search this? Okay, right. Um, now, Sabrina, college is a very important time in a young girl's life. You need to be properly attired. Trust me, a young girl is completely and solely judged by her appearance. All right, let's begin. I always start every wardrobe from the top, the hat. Remember, Sabrina, it's the first thing that God sees when you walk outside in the morning. <laughs> you know what, Miss oh, Celine? So you, ain't, you ain't wrong. And uh, yeah, Alex, Alex Forstein was, Forstein. <laughs> yeah, such a good get for that show. I know, you know, I think anyone who's like really knowledgeable in the fandom knows that she was, you know, our are supposed to be our OG Suki. It's fine. You know, Melissa McCarthy is just next level, but I'm yeah. glad at least that when she didn't retain that role, that she was still kept around in the show as Drella and as Miss Celine, and that we still got to see glimpses of her because she is a hilarious comedic actress. <laughs> uh, Emily, um, do you need breasts or will yours suffice? <laughs> yeah, exactly. uh, so good. Uh, yeah. Olive oil on the inside and the outside. <laughs> Let's not talk. You're ruining olive oil for me. Stop it. <laughs> oh, we don't want your Deanna Durbins to tumble out. Stop. <laughs> uh, Deanna. <laughs> yeah, I just watched the revival. So that one's on the brain. But. Yeah, Miss Celine kind of with her fashion advice had to be mentioned in this episode, obviously. But again, that wraps my episode or my list. Do you have anything else that like stands out to you that you want to make sure we cram in here? Uh no, I mean from a fashion and costuming perspective, I will just say that I really did enjoy the outfits um that were worn when Rory is hosting the World War II like DAR event and everyone gets dressed up and those period pieces, but that wasn't really so much like a personal fashion costuming choice as much as it was like a, 
an event scale choice. So there's not much to touch upon with that. I just wanted to say like, I appreciated those outfits and good work on the costuming and the people working in that department for that episode. But that's really all I have left. Yeah. I guess I'll just sort of like end on sort of like Gilmore's personal influence on my fashion in terms of like, I'm definitely out here being like, oh my God, that is so Emily Gilmore and, and making selections based on that. And you know, that like the coastal grandma vibes are immaculate with Emily in the revival. And I just, I want it that, you know, that's the life. Um, She's just, oh, and she wears this like beautiful pink suit in the revival too. I don't think I've ever seen her in such a bright shade of fuchsia. It's almost like kind of the same color as my headband. Mm -hmm. And she wears lipstick to match. And I'm like, she's only ever worn that like soft pink suit and lots of suits in like navies and greens. But this like bright, bold color on her is so beautiful. And yeah, I just, I think the fashion and the wealth and the, eliteness and elegance aspect is is there and we're starting to talk about this more as a society too with like talks about the old money aesthetic and quiet luxury and stealth wealth um you know when you look at emily she has a curated collection of appropriate attire and she maintains it and she knows how to dress for an occasion versus you know lorelei's grasping at youth and and hopping on trends, just the the difference between them on a class level. I'm sure we'll talk about that more when we get to classism. And, you know, we kind of alluded to it earlier, but didn't even really talk about the Hermes bag, the, the Birkin yes. situation. You know, it was a gift. So it's like, it's hard to evaluate because it wasn't necessarily a choice Rory made for herself but when Logan made for her I was like I want you to have this the status symbol and this beautiful thing yeah which I mean I'm not gonna lie it felt a bit ostentatious and just as like a display of wealth it was unnecessary um but at the same time I'm over here just being like Girl, so you, wouldn't pretty. Say no, you wouldn't say no to a handbag like that. So shut up. Yeah, that's basically the dream handbag because pink is my favorite color. So I'm like, yes, please. Give me that Hermes. Yeah. Huh. Oh. I don't have anything else if you don't. I think this is a good enough spot to wind us down because we have been going on quite some time now. Yeah. We said 60 to 75 minutes and we blew it out of the water again. Yay. I'm so Typical. shocked and surprised. I know. I was like, oh, this will be a nice quick one to, you know, get through. It'll be nice and easy, breezy, beautiful cover girl. <laughs> I was about to say the same thing. But okay. Rent free, baby. <laughs> get out of my head. Um, yeah, I guess that does in fact wrap us up. Yeah, I could say uh, more, but I won't. Oh, we always have more to say. Uh, look, if you ever want, look, if you're ever watching this video and you want a Gilmore Girls six hour long episode, just drop us a comment. <laughs> We're not, we can't not do it. We just choose not to for the sake of the viewers and for perhaps our own personal well being sometimes. Yeah. We could do it. And if you want it, let us know. If you want a six hour GG episode, we'll, we can deliver. It's we can talk. really, it's easy peasy, love and squeezy. We've done it before. Um, yeah. That being said, what is coming up next week for us on the Gilmore Way that we can, again, keep to under two hours and not talk about for six? I don't know if we can keep it under two hours. We're talking about family loyalty. So some of those moments in the show where, you know, the family name kind of holds people together more than it should a little bit. And and the idea that family is the most important thing besides education and pie. A. 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 I'm not going to have a family. lot to say. I'm not going to have a lot to say about this at all. Yeah. I'm going to have to go watch all the Fast and Furious movies because um, something, something family. Um, you know, so we'll be yeah, talking no. about, yeah, we'll be talking about like when Strobe insults Lorelai and, Richard stands up for her in terms of like defending the family name. And we'll be talking about um, like, I certainly have thoughts on Jason suing Richard and Lorelai siding with Richard over 
Jason in that scenario and just sort of like her finally picking her family over someone else um, when she might not have done that in the, the past. So we're kind of going to dig into some moments like that where blood is thicker than water. Yeah, indeed. I'm excited for that one. I know that you are too. Um, we hope that you'll come back and join us for that episode. We promise that we're going to have a lot of good thoughts. Um, in the meantime, if you want more GG content, it's the fall. We are officially in rewatch season, folks, although we're watching year round. But yeah, now when are we never, not? <laughs> when are we not? But it is the fall. So now is even a more perfect time. Go back and binge the show. Just get through all of those episodes. Watch the revival. And if you want even more content beyond that, go back and watch some of our old videos. Uh, we're always grateful for the support. Um, and if you want to share any of those videos, we're equally grateful for that as well. As uh, along with doing all of those YouTube things for us, please just always remember to like this video, subscribe to our channel. It's one click below and it really does help us out. And again, we are so always immensely grateful for it. Indeed. Well, on that note, we'll see you next Friday. For Cheers. Dinner. Have a good weekend. Happy weekend. Bye. Bye.